with Holy Ghost joy, let's welcome the senior pastor of Calvary Churches Worldwide, Apostle of Money. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and many, many things. God bless. Mercy said no. <laughs> I'm not gonna let you go. Yes. I'm not gonna let you slip away. Wow. You don't have to be afraid. Mercy said no. Sin will never take control. Life and death stood face to face. Darkness tried to steal my heart away. But thank you, Jesus. Mercy said no. Once again, can we just lift up our hands and thank Him for His mercy? Thank Him for His mercy. Thank Him for His saving grace. Thank him for his enabling grace. Thank him for his sustaining grace. The word of God declares, if it has not been the Lord who was on our side, what will we say? Lift up your voice and just give him thanks. It's not of him that will it, nor him that run it, but of the Lord that shows mercy. He said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Let's thank him for his mercy. Lord, we thank you for your mercy we thank you for your mercy in jesus name we have worshiped hallelujah put your hands together celebrate jesus before you take your seat once again can we honor the man of god and the woman bless you man and woman of god please be seated in god's presence what a mighty god we serve we have a long way to go today if you are um, not here yesterday. I'm going to try to do a brief recap, but please go to the book stand and get the materials. Uh, cracking the Bologna Code. Massive, massive product. This is the real estate executive masterclass. How to start and grow your own real estate business. It comes with a massive manual. There are 10 DVDs and also comes with a one-year mentorship. How to be a best-selling author. It's also uh, seven audio programs and a massive manual. And then yesterday, we began to speak from, uh, this one is called The Pathway to Wealth. So some of the things we shared yesterday, my story, and some of the things we're going to share today are from this one. And this is called The Jubilee Park. We have four books in here, Birth in a New Nigeria. A new Nigeria is only possible if you of money, how to make, manage, and multiply your money, the entrepreneur's blueprint. So um, you can, for those of you that are listening online, you can go to my website, www.olumide.com. Emmanuel.org, www.olumideemmanuel.org, and there you can get the material. There is a secure payment platform there. You can get the materials. And then for those that want physical ones, we have offices in Ghana, in South Africa, in London, in New York, Atlanta, and Houston. So you can contact any of the offices. Just um, contact us maybe through my social media platform, and then we'll connect you to any of the offices. Amen. Okay, are we ready? Spirit of the living God, we have come again into your presence where nothing is impossible. Lord, we ask that as we go into your word today, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our heart to gain understanding. Lord, let no one live here the same. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and the saints of God shout a big amen. I can't hear your amen. Okay, so yesterday, um, we began by looking into what I simply entitled, uh, understanding and manifesting kingdom wealth and there are about 12 different modules or sessions that we need to look into but i think we're able to do about four or five of them um the first thing is to give you a definition of kingdom wealth so kingdom wealth is a wealth that has its source in god and the kingdom as its purpose kingdom wealth is a wealth that has its source in god and the kingdom has its purpose. Kingdom wealth is a wealth that has its source in God, and the kingdom has its purpose. So when you talk about kingdom wealth, it's a wealth that comes from God, and it's a wealth that is based on the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. So we saw in the text yesterday, in Deuteronomy 
uh, chapter 8 and verse number 18, it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get well, that he may establish his covenant. So the source of kingdom wealth is God. The purpose of kingdom wealth is the kingdom and the covenant. And then we went on to establish the fact that if you want to become rich and wealthy, there are two options. You either do it God's way, kingdom way, covenant way, or you do it Babylon way or the way of this world. And you are either in the secret court or you are in the secret place. There is no middle ground. You've got to choose where you belong. Then we moved on to be able to establish the fact that as God's children, there are basic facts we need to have understanding about if we're going to walk in kingdom work. Number one, God is your source. God is your source. Everything you do is just a resource. God is your source. When you put your trust in God as your source, he can now determine what he wants to use as a resource in your life part time. So your focus should never be on your job, your career, your business, your giftings, your ability. Your focus should always be on your source. Because when you trust in God, he is the one that will now make a way for you. So it's not about the principle it's about the principal. It's not about the gift. It's about the giver of the gift. Number two, the kingdom is the purpose of wealth. God is not trying to make you wealthy so that you can show them. He's not trying to make you wealthy so that you can be able to just have all kinds of clothes, all kinds of shoes. There is a limit to what these things can do in your life, as we saw yesterday. So it's all about the kingdom. Ephesians 4, he says, let him that still, still no more, but let him do what? Let him walk with his hand, that which is good, why? That he may have to give so that you can be equipped because prosperity is having enough of God's resources to be able to fulfill the assignment of God. And we saw the error of prosperity without a purpose and money without a mission. Number three, we saw that kingdom wealth is entrusted. It's not acquired. It's entrusted. In this kingdom, in order for you to become wealthy, God must trust you in order to entrust wealth to you. So God will not give to you what he cannot get through you. Number four, we established, which is where we wrapped up yesterday, that addiction to God and his kingdom is the trigger addiction to God and his kingdom is the trigger for kingdom wealth. Seek ye first the kingdom. Put him first. When you seek him first, every other thing that people are struggling to get, God will bring it into your life as an addition because there's the general blessings of God, there's the added blessings of God, and there's the sure blessings of God. The general blessings of God comes to everyone as a result of his sovereignty as a creator. The added blessings of God only comes to those who have made his kingdom their priority. So when you are at to the kingdom. It's not going to be by your labor. It's going to be by the favor of God and by the hand of God's mercy. And then we wrapped it up yesterday by establishing the fact that the spirit of the addiction will always provide for the addiction. So today, let's move on. But today, because of the parts we want to go into right now, I need to lay a foundation um, to try to help the church with reference to some of the confusion that has happened in the life of people. So let's begin from Third John 2. Third John 2. Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospered. And I want to start from there, then we're going to um, we look at the aspect of the law, and then we'll begin to look at the fifth dimension today. Now listen, please listen. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as so prosperous. So many times when we read the scripture, our focus is always on, he wants us to prosper and be in health. But not many times have we actually sat down to look at the prosperity of the soul. Because what he's saying there is that the prosperity of your soul is the engine upon which every other thing will prosper. So it's like a train. The engine of the train is in front and then we have different cabins that are drawn by the engine of a train. So what God is saying is I wish that you prosper and be in health. But this my wish, my desire for you is based on the fact that the engine, the train is moving. So what is the prosperity of the soul? Because see, Many of the challenges we have is because when we come into the kingdom, we forget that when you become born again, 
Being born again is a regeneration of your human spirit that must translate to the maturity of your soul and the redemption of your body. So we have a lot of us that have come into church, we are saved, our spirit is saved, but we have refused to develop our soul and take care of our body. So all the things that God promised us is not able to manifest because we don't do this. So let me break down, let me do a crash course in human anatomy and a crash course in the mind. Now you are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. You are not your body. You are not your soul. You are a spirit. Hello? Romans 12. That you present your body. So man of God, please present your diary. Present it to me. Now you have presented the diary to me. So this is not you. So what you presented to me, I can walk away with and you will still remain. So God was not speaking to the body. He was speaking to spirits to present body. So the body is not you. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. Now, your spirit has three compartments. And everything about your spirit is where you have what we call God consciousness. So in your spirit, you have the umpire or conscience. You have the intuition. And then you have the worship compartment. Those are three compartments, and it gives you connection with God. But in your soul, you have four compartments. You have your mind, your will, your emotion, and your intellect. It is with your soul that you have what is called self-consciousness. In your body, you have five compartments. The sight, the hearing, the smelling, the touch, and the taste. And with that, you have what we call world consciousness. Now, listen and listen. We're talking about the prosperity of the soul. Now, in these three compartments, uh, you need to understand that if they are not being developed, you will not be able to maximize your possibilities in God. If you develop your spirit alone and you don't develop your soul, there will be a deficiency in your work with God. If you develop your spirit and your soul and you don't develop your body, there will be a deficiency in your work with God. And that's why people that do not take care of their body can end up being anointed and like Elisha, they can die with fire in their bones. Yet they died of sickness. Now, but you see, in that soul, you have three windows. One of the windows in your soul opens to the past. One of the windows in your soul opens to the present. One of the windows in your soul opens to the future. Now, what are these three windows? Memory, contemplation, and imagination. So in your mind, which is the seat of your being, you have the memory window that gives you the ability to replay the past. You have the contemplation window that gives you the ability to sit and think intelligently about what you are going through, what you have learned in order to make the right decision to move forward. And then you have the imagination window that gives you the ability to visit the future and return into today to make the decision that will take you into the future that you desire. So, when the Bible says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as a soul prosper, he's saying that I want you to give attention to the prosperity of your soul and make sure that you continue to develop yourself so that everything that I want to do, you will have the capacity to capture it. Because there are things, I don't know if you know much about power, but you see all these high tension wires. They are carrying electricity. But electricity cannot go from there into your house. It has to be stepped down. So there has to be a transformer that will step it down to the level where it can be utilized in your house. But if you have capacity, God is saying, I want you to continue to grow your capacity so that you can enter a frequency where you can be getting things at the level that is beyond those that do not have a soul that is developed. Hello. So please... Let's stop all this coming to church and just thinking that Christianity is all about your spirit. No, it's about the totality of your being. And you cannot be a spiritual giant and an emotional dwarf. You can't come into church and you are intellectually deficient. Christianity is not for dull people. Christianity is not for dropper. So, so you have to be intelligent. The Bible says you must have a ready answer for those that ask you the basis of your faith. So we need to understand that so that you won't just come to church and we pray, pray, pray. Because I got a lot of feedback yesterday and I was telling, I said, look, listen to me. Ignorance is not a demon. You can't cast it out. 
Nobody saying there is nothing. Nobody saying there is a problem with prayer. But there are some things in life that cannot happen by prayer. Prayer is not a master key. No scripture said that. Prayer is a key. There are many other keys. Hello. So there is nothing wrong in prayer. But in order for you to enter into the fullness of God, you have to understand all the keys that are available. Now I hope you know that we are all blind. Nobody sees. Eyes don't see. If they switch off all the lights here now, we will not see anything. Why? Because your eyes don't see. The only reason why your eyes see is by the reflection of light. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness and darkness cannot comprehend it. So everyone that lacks the light of knowledge and understanding is blind. And to the degree where you are ignorant, that's the degree of your darkness. So every time you come to church, you are enlightened. They behold him and they were... Hello? So please, let's develop our soul. Let's buy books. Let's buy them. Let's not just come to church, scream and jump and shout out, and then you are not doing what you need to do. No. You cannot be anointed to prosper. Hello? Anointing for prosperity. No, no, no. no. Let's stop all this because we are making light of these things. Hello? Are you ready for this? The anointing is powerful and tangible. But if you meet with zero knowledge, whatever you multiply by zero equals to zero. You cannot be anointed to drive. You can't be anointed to become a medical doctor. You can't be anointed to become a pilot. Why? There is a knowledge base that has to be in place. That's the development of the soul. Hello? Look, as powerful as our father in the Lord is, Pastor Yadebo, if all of us get to the airport now on the way to Abuja, and we arrive at the airport, and the pilot is sick, and Baba says, no problem, what God cannot do does not exist. I'm going to drive you to Abuja. And Baba takes over the plane to become the pilot. How many of you will remain on the flight? Is it that it's not only? No, because in this world, you cannot just say, you know, I'm just born again and I'm cool. No, you've got to develop yourself. Number two, listen, because of what I want to begin to teach you now. Listen. There is a confusion that ought not to be there, except for the fact that many of us don't read our Bible. And then we have this confusion of they say it's a grace movement. Listening and listening well. Hey, we are not on that law. Please, please. Anything you don't understand, keep quiet or ask questions. Stop talking anyhow. No man of God is God. He's a man of God. The, the greatest of all men is a man at his very best. And that is why you need to know God for yourself. I told you yesterday, God does not have grandchildren. We all have equal access to God. The word of God is open for you to seek God for yourself. So after the pastor has said it, go back home as a brilliant Christian and say, what's here the Lord? So that God can open your eyes. Now listen. Listen very carefully. There is nobody on earth that can live without the law. This kingdom, oh, I don't know about any other kingdom, this kingdom, where I've been a minister for 33 years. It's not a lawless kingdom. So for somebody to say we are not under the law, far, 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 far. The question is, which law? Which law? Hello? Which law? Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Why? For there is a law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. You are delivered from one law into another law. It's called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And guess what? It's a more dangerous law. Hello? So all this lawlessness, I can live anyhow. Far, 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 far. Guess what? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus existed from Genesis chapter 1 before there was any law. John chapter 1, I believe, verse 17, it says, The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. So, question Are you ready for this? When Joseph refused to sleep with Potiphar's wife, what law was he obeying? There was no written law against adultery, woman of God. But there was a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus based on intimacy with God, not connection to a church. And Joseph said, I will not do this great wickedness. Uh, wickedness, Babu, where did you read it? What verse of the scripture? It doesn't exist. There was no scripture against adultery. 
but there was a law at work in a man that had intimacy with God and God was able to speak into his spirit what belongs to another man don't touch he said I will not do this great wickedness and sin against my God Genesis 14 if I before we go to Genesis 14 Genesis chapter 8 and Noah came out of the hack and when he came out of the ark, what church was Noah going to? What church was Cain and Abel going to? Where they taught them about false fruit, where they taught them about tithe, where they taught them about giving nothing. They were not going to any church. They didn't have a pastor, but they had the God. The problem with today is we have pastors, we have churches, but we don't have God. When you have God, you will argue with giving. Yes, sir. When you have God, you will not argue. Huh? Because when you have God, uh, you will know that everything you have belongs to him. 10% is an insult. Yes, Who was Abraham's pastor, man? Who was the pastor of Noah? Noah came out of the ark. Huh? And when he looked around, huh? Modupe, Morianuba. Modupe, Mori Anuba. Tori kise popo eniyo. Lori, he came out and saw dead body and saw skeleton. Say, who am I? Who am I? The only me and my family is alive. This is mercy graduation level. And Noah took. Nobody told him. Nobody taught him. Nobody preached to him. Nobody forced him. Relationship compels you. For God so loved the world that he gave. For we so love him that we give. And he gave and God smelled something. Question, if he didn't give, was God smelling something? Hello? When Abraham brought tithes to Melchizedek, God did not say, go and carry and give to Melchizedek. Okay. Melchizedek did not say, Abraham, bring me that. No. Abraham had a relationship with God. He had an understanding. And the Bible says, and Abraham gave. Abraham did not pay tithes. He gave tithes. Hello? So are you ready now? Having laid that foundation, number one, God is your source. Number two, the kingdom is the purpose. Number three, kingdom wealth is entrusted, not acquired. Number four, Addiction to the kingdom is a trigger for kingdom work number five, which is what we want to sit down today. Uncompromising obedience to covenant obligation releases the blessing. Uncompromising obedience to covenant obligation releases the blessing. So in this kingdom, if you want to manifest kingdom wealth, you don't argue with covenant obligation. In this kingdom, if you want to manifest kingdom wealth, you have to align yourself with the kingdom culture of giving, with the kingdom culture of covenant obligation. There are about 15 different obligations expected of every child of God. So get the book, Pathway to Wealth, they're listed here. But because of the brevity of time, let me give you just a crash course in each of this one. Number one is the first fruit. First fruit. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. And then go and do further study. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance and, and is a conjunction, and with the first fruit of all thine increase. All thine increase. So there is a place for what is called the first fruit. Now, the first belongs to God. The first of everything, not only money. When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you should do? Pray is first fruit. First thing you do in the morning is pray. That's first fruit. First day of the week, first day of the month. It's also, so it's not only about money. It's not only about money. Read your Bible. Romans 11 verse 16. If the roots be holy, then are the branches. So the first is based on the principle of representation. Go to the east. Go to different culture. They have New Year festival. They have New Year. They have festivals where they say, okay, the first that came out, oh, we recognize that it is not our power. It's not our ability to farm. We are bringing this to you as the first. So it's called first fruit. Now listen, it is not a law. Hello, it's a covenant obligation of love to those who acknowledge that God is their source. 
If God is not your source, you don't need to do it. It's not for everybody. Hello? So first fruits. It's a law of representative. Once one is taken, it covers all. Number two is the tithe. The tithe. The tithe. Genesis 14. Abraham gave tithe of all to make his death. Tithe of what? Of all. Why? Abraham did not pay tithe. He gave tithe. And when Abraham existed, there was no law. So anyone that is telling you that tithing has to do with the law is deceiving you. Tithe has nothing to do with the law because the law did not come unto Moses. Moses was not there where Abraham was bringing the tithe. Abraham gave the tithe. He did not pay tithe. The only reason why they were now commanded to pay tithe is because when they left and went to Egypt, they forgot God and they started doing other things. And when they came out of Egypt, he now told them, return to me. They said, how do we return? The tithe you are supposed to be bringing, the offering, you need to return back to the original intention. Tithe is an act of worship. Tithe is a seed you sow in honor of the fact that God is your source and you acknowledge it. Listen and listen well. One of the challenges with the church is that they are telling you to bring 10% but nobody is telling you what to do with the remaining 90%. So because there is no financial intelligence and nobody is telling you what to do with the remaining 90%, you bring the 10 and by your financial illiteracy and financial irresponsibility, you mess up the 90 and turn around to blame the church. That is the 10 that they collected that made you to be poor. Far, 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 far. Listen to me. Listen. 10% is not the problem. Lack of understanding is the problem. So if you have 100,000, how much is your 10%? Are you telling me 10,000 is your problem? No. When you go to cinema with the girls to have a guest day out, or you go to the movie with the boys to have a boys day out, what is 10K? You cannot even buy correct, you know, correct fish, you know, pepper fish with correct, you know, chapman. 10K, you know, get some shawarma and some chips and some ice. 10K will not work. So 10,000 is nothing. When you are in the restaurant, you spend it without thinking. When you enter saloon to fix eyelashes and fix nails and fix and fix everything, 10,000 is nothing. Ayi go bri agade, kadi kabukata. 10,000 is nothing. So when you are in the saloon, it's nothing. When you are in the restaurant, it's nothing. But when you put 10,000 in an envelope, it suddenly becomes something. Why? Whatever God places a demand on becomes a point of contention. It's not the 10,000. It's the fact that you don't understand that every time God places a demand on something, it has left the realm of money. It has entered the realm of spirit. So it's no more about the money. It's mammon versus God. So pastor, what are you talking about? If you want to run away, we'll think about it. You can go a whole day without eating and you'll be fine. But once we declare fasting, 8 a.m. a below my G. Eh? You wake up with hunger. Is it food that is a problem? No. Once we declare fasting, it's no more food. It's an altar. So all this argument about tithe and offering, the devil knows the power of the altar. He knows the power of having something that speaks for you. They want to silence your voice. Religion without sacrifice is a fraud. Nobody can ever become rich without giving. From Elon Musk to Bill Gates to Warren Buffett, they are the greatest. A secret court, you are absent. Secret place, you are absent. You are contending with a contract with someone that has opened the womb of a pregnant woman, brought out a three-month-old baby, grounded with, with black pepper, and have been betting in it for three months. And then fasting, you refuse to fast. Pray, you refuse to pray. Give, you refuse to give. And then you show up and say, I'm a child of God and I'm cool. Omar Kuni, I'm cool. Listen. Listen, listen. There are voices that speak in heaven. You see, that court that the man of God was talking about, the court of heaven, there are voices that sit on the table to speak for you. Look at how Memukan, only one man, Memukan, I want to talk to Memukan, Memukan. 
He said, no. Ah, he continued to she say, if you allow her to continue, all of that women will begin to insult their husband. Have they not been insulting you before? Have you done anything? But nobody spoke for her. There are five voices that speaks in heaven. Number one is the voice of worship. When you worship, it ascends to the heaven. That worship will sit on that table. Show them your manifesto that your presence are worship. Number two is the voice of prayer. Your prayer will arrive in that table in the court. Uh, sit down at the table representing you. So when they say worship, presence, uh, he has worshipped you. Prayer, presence. Uh, number three is service. Uh, when you serve, uh, the Bible says that Dorcas died. Uh, and they came, they said, ah, Dorcas cannot die like that. Uh, everybody can die, not Dorcas. Uh, look at her service. Uh, look at her good works. Uh, and she was brought back to life. Uh, there are people that did not die, that they are praying for them to die. Uh, because when you were present, we didn't feel you. Uh, if your absence is not felt, uh, your presence is inconsequential. But there's another voice that speaks. It's called the voice of the blood. The voice of the blood. It says the voice of the blood of your brother. Abel is crying out to me. Every time you go to work and you labor, you are laboring with your blood. When they give you money, that money is a representation of your sweat and your tears and your blood. Every time you bring that money as a seed upon the altar, you are shedding blood. It begins to speak for you in the realm of the spirit. What voice? is speaking for you. Hello? Hello? Because of time, let me move on. He said, if I let me give you one more point about this titan thing. You see, the seed of every fruit is the poisonous part. The seed of every fruit is the poisonous part. And the reason why the seed is poisonous is because the chemical mechanism and infrastructure for the perpetuation of that tree and fruit is always in the seed. So every time you get a fruit, you are to eat the fruit and sow the seed. You don't eat seed because when you eat seed, you eat future. So for everyone that gets an income, a portion of that income is called the tithe. It's the poisonous part. When you eat it, it hurts you. When you release it, it blesses you. So it's not a debt that you owe. It's a seed that you sow. If God is not your source, don't tithe. If God is not your source. If you are a self-made man, keep your money. Hello? But if God is your source, the entire 100% belongs to him. But he said, bring me the 10 in acknowledgement of the fact that I'm your source. And I will redeem the 90 and give you wisdom on how to continue. Third one is offering. Everybody say offering. Everybody say offering. So number one is first truth. Number two is time. Number three is offering. The word of God declares, thou shalt not come into the presence of the Lord empty and dead. Empty and dead. You cannot just show up. See the scripture that man of God quoted. The gift of a man makes room for him. It's not the ability to sing alone. You saw it. So offering. Everybody say offering. Offering. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Verse 16 to 17. Thou shall not appear before the Lord empty and dead. In Luke chapter 6 verse 37 and 38. Let me show you a, a scripture. Luke 6. 37 to 38. Every time you start from 38 alone, you will not get the picture. From verse 37, it says, judge not, and you shall not be judged. What does that mean, man of God? Judge not, because one of the reasons why many people find it difficult to give is because they have already judged the church and the man of God. You have already judged them. They are after our money. So why will you bring money to somebody that you think is a thief when you're not a fool? So he didn't say give all. He said, number one, judge not. Judge not. Don't judge every man of God as fake. Fake is a proof of original. If there is no original, there will be no fake. And the genuine one are now becoming a victims of the fake one. You have no idea the price of ministry. But God has structured the kingdom in such a way that the different covenant obligation is the income 
some dimension of ministry. Because whether you are a church or not, you will buy diesel. Whether you are a church or not, you will pay salary. Whether you are a church or not, you will do what? Organization is also have to follow the organizational structure of organizational management. And income and expenditure is part of that equation. Hello? So it says what? Judge not and you shall not be judged. What's the second one? It says condemn not and you shall not be what does it mean? You have already condemned all the men of God and all the churches. So somebody you have condemned, will you give money to them? No. So it says judge not, condemn not, forgive. Why? There are actually fake men of God. Charlatans. People that food for belly, belly for food. And they have used the scripture and use their position to manipulate people and destroy people's life. And they will told you, you cannot see me until you see me. So for you to see them, you must see them. And if you don't see them, you can't see them. And they have made church highest bidder, front row for the highest giver. Why? So because some people have experienced all these charlatans, God is now saying, don't judge the future by the past. Forgive. The last one deceived you. This one is not a deceiver. Hello? Listen to me. They came. They say, no one can do this mighty work except God is with him. When you come into a place like this, you don't need to doubt that God is here. Everyone whose life has changed is a proof that God is here. He now says, then give. So judge not, condemn not, forgive, then give. Until you do the first three, giving will be a problem for you. Giving will be a problem for you. Then he now said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake it together and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. But that's not the end of the story. He said, with the same measure that you measure, it shall be measured back to you. Listen and listen well. If you appear before the ocean with a cup, ocean is not aware. If you appear before the ocean with a drum, ocean is not aware. If you appear before the ocean with a tank, ocean is not aware. You are the one that is aware of what you took. Ocean is ocean. So God will not go down when everybody becomes rich. Hello? If everybody here gets one, one billion, it doesn't reduce God. It doesn't increase God. God is God. Same yesterday, today, forever. So whatever you get is a function of what you brought to the table. So if you are always giving sparingly, you will reap sparingly. When you are always giving bountifully, you will reap bountifully. So you can now come to church and say, hey, I have done for you, I have given my tithe. Offering is just anything. No, sir. Offering is not anything. Huh? Because you cannot sow on one plot and expect to reap the same thing as someone that sowed on 10 acres. The measure of your seed determines the measure of your harvest. But you know the problem with many of us, because we compare ourselves with people, the poo of an elephant can never be compared to the poo of a chicken. It can never be compared. Some of you are elephants. Your poo is like chicken poo Elephant is so big that even this poo is heavy. So when you come to church, you don't give like a poor man. You give based on your level. You cannot be someone earning a million a month, 500,000 a month, and when it's offering time, you are dropping 500 naira, like somebody that is earning 30,000. It is an error. With the same measure that you measure, it shall be measured back to you. Let me go, there are about 15 of them. Let's rush through them. So number one is what? First, so number two. Number three. Okay, so let's go. Oh my God. Lakabaraka, shata. Legedigedede. Talk to the neighbor. With the same measure that you measure, it shall be measured back to you. Okay, with the same measure that you measure, it shall be measured back to you. Okay, now let's go. Number four. Sacrifice. Somebody say sacrifice. Somebody say sacrifice. Somebody say sacrifice. Ah! Time. Now listen. In this kingdom, 
There are things that will never happen until you pray. Hello? They will never happen until you pray. That's one level. But there are things that you can pray from today to tomorrow. It won't happen until you add fasting to your prayer. Why? This kind. Someone say, this kind. So there are different kinds. There is a kind that does not answer to prayer alone. Fasting must attach to it. This kind cometh not forth but by prayer and fasting. But there is a kind that when you fast and pray, it will still not work until they see the soul. So sacrifice is another level. I told you about the general blessings, the added blessings, and the sure blessings. The sure blessings of God are for those that understand the power of sacrifice. Let me give you something very fast. Genesis 22. The Lord spoke to Abraham, and God said to him, Abraham, bring now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Please note the scripture. God is speaking to Abraham, and God said to Abraham, bring now your son, your only son, the one you love, sir. Uh -uh. I thought Abraham had two children. No. Abraham only had one child. Abraham gave birth to Isaac. Abraham gave birth to uh, Abraham gave birth to Ishmael. Abraham gave birth to Isaac. So God is saying to Abraham, I don't want the child of, <laughs> of your sinful nature. I want you to bring now your son, your only son, the one that you love. Because if what you are given is not something that is dear to you, it's not a sacrifice. A sacrifice must leave a vacuum in your life uh, when it exits your life. Uh. So he said, bring now your son, your only son, the one you love. Uh. And guess what? And Abraham took Isaac and was going towards the altar. Question. Abraham was in his 90s. Isaac was a teenager. In the realm of strength, uh, Isaac can carry Abraham, beat him up, and put him on the altar. But when Abraham said, Isaac, we are going on a journey, Isaac surrendered. Because if you are not in control of your finances, you are in error. If your finances are the one controlling you, you cannot let go of what controls you. So Abraham took Isaac, and as he was going, Isaac was matured enough to understand this kingdom dynamics. He said, excuse me, sir, uh, I can see the wood, I can see the rope, I can see the knife, but excuse me, daddy, where is the sacrifice because the altar is powerless without a sacrifice. It's when the sacrifice is on the altar that the fire will fall. Where is the sacrifice? And Abraham looks at Isaac and he said, Isaac, you remember when I was leaving the guys behind? I told them, I am going with you yonder to worship and to return. So this journey is a journey of worship. God will provide himself a sacrifice. Because that was talking about the Calvary cross and Jesus. But guess what? The Bible says in verse 13 of Genesis 22, when they got to the altar, he got there with his Isaac. He laid his Isaac on the altar. He tied him up. He lifted up the sword. As he was about to go, he said, stop! It was only a test. I only wanted to be sure whether you love me enough to let go. Because whatever you cannot give has conquered you. And God said, look behind you. Someone said, look behind you. Look behind you. There is a ram caught in a ticket. So what does that mean? As Abraham was going to the altar with his Isaac, the provision was coming behind him. Everyone that focuses on God and focuses on the kingdom and focuses on the altar, everything they need will be coming behind them. But the problem with many of us, we've turned our back on the altar and we are pursuing the ram. Time. Let's move on. So many grounds to cover. Number four. Or number five. Welfare. Welfare. Proverbs 28, 27. Proverbs 28, 27. Different scriptures. The woman of God spoke extensively about that. We're talking about seeds of mercy. Welfare. Listen to me. Welfare is not sustenance. Welfare is a temporary relief measure to ensure that things don't go bad. Hello? 
Because one of the things we have seen right now is that the church is being blackmailed with welfare. Oh, give to this, give to You can give rice and give food and give everything and people will still go to hell. Because salvation does not come by welfare and palliative. To him that has shall more be given. Now get ready for this one. He said, to him that has not. That's not the end. He said, even that which he has shall be taken. So there is nobody that does not have. You see, I don't have. He said, hey, you don't have. He said, even that which he has. You think you don't have, but there is things you have. But many of us, we keep saying, I don't have, I don't have. And that's why you don't have. Because you continue to use your mouth to call bad things upon yourself. When you understand the prosperity of the soul, there are faculties of success that God has embedded in the soul. The imagination, the thoughts, the confession, the expectation. These faculties are free of charge. You don't need money to expect. You don't need money to imagine. You don't need money, money to confess. But everything that God says to you is free. You are using your mouth to confess evil, your mind to expect evil, your mind to imagine evil. You are using your hand to do yourself. Hello? So, welfare. Someone say welfare. So, whether you are an individual, a family, a church, an organization, every day, every week, every month, you must have a system in place where something flows from you to those that are less privileged. Because when you give down, it guarantees that you will not go down. You solidify your ground. He that gives to the poor lends to God and God will repay. He that closes his ears to the cry of the poor, he also will cry and shall not be heard. Number five, vows. Vows. You see, let me help you because I'm just hearing in the spirit now. Somebody say, ah, Bogwelei, ah, everything. It's like, ah, how many giving are we going to give? Now, let me help you understand. Are you ready? I'm not here here. You pay rent. Let me see your hand. Now, apart from rent, keep the hands up. Those of you that are paying rent, you are paying rent. Now, if you are paying rent, keep your hands up, but you don't pay for a recharge card, you don't pay for NEPA, you don't pay for food. Put your hands down. You see that your hands are still up. The same you, you pay for rent. Rent is for the shelter, not for the food. So you can pay rent and die of hunger in a house you paid for. Because what rent will do is just to give you a shelter. But the same you that pay for rent, you will look for another money to settle food so that you can eat. The same you that has a roof over your head and you are eating, you will look for another money to recharge your phone. That's why we are here to be recharged because God does not need recharge. We can't recharge God. It's me and you that needs to be recharged. God is forever charged. We are here for him to charge us and recharge us for his everlasting charging. Guess what? So listen, listen, listen. So it is the same you. If you have a car, you buy for it. But you don't complain. Landlord will collect his own. School will collect their own. But when you now come to church, ah, me have given title. This one they are talking to you. I don't understand again. No. Ah, all this offering is too much. No. On that offering envelope, every giving is a window to something that the other window cannot take you to. So all these things we are looking at now, some of you, all your life, you have never done some of them. And that's why you don't know what's on the other side of your obedience. Because until you do it, you never know what you are missing. Someone say vows. What's a vow? A vow is an invitation from humanity to divinity into a covenant. When you are breaking a vow, you are inviting God into a covenant. You are saying, God, if you do this, I will do this. That's a vow. Inviting God into a covenant. It's not God telling you to do anything. It's you that say, ah, I need something that will shift things. When Anna waited for a child and there was no child coming, she activated the vow. I said, God, give me a son. I give you a prophet. I seen a need in your house. There is no prophet. I will be the one that will carry a prophet for you. Lord, give me a son. I will return him to you as a prophet. Just for them to know that this woman can be a child. And God answered. Every time you come to God from the covenant of vows, God has no choice but to move in order to show you that he is ever faithful. It is we that is unfaithful. Hello? Jephthah said, as I'm going to this battle, if you can allow me to win, 
Lord, the first that come out, I will offer to you. And guess what? When Jephthah returned, the first that came out was his daughter, not his wife. You will get that tomorrow. <laughs> the guy was probably calculating the key idea. I'm a co Lord. <laughs> Let this woman come. Let me sew her as a seat. <laughs> And move on with my life. But the daughter came out and said, hey! Boy, he said, my daughter, I have made a vow. I have to let it go. There is something about a vow. When you make a vow to God, there is a shift. Look, let me give you a revelation. A prophet went into a city one day and the woman saw the prophet and said, this is a holy man of God. And the woman created a room for the prophet. And then the prophet keeps coming and entering that room. One day the prophet said, uh-uh, this woman cannot be blessed us like this. Let's bless her. And he said, what do we do for her? He said, I don't you notice that she doesn't have a child. The woman comes, stays at the edge of the door. In her own household, she didn't enter. Because when she said, this one is a holy man of God, it's because she has encountered many unholy men of God that want to do it by themselves. So she stood by the door. And the man of God said, do you want me to speak to the keeper? He said, no, 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 I know everybody. He said, hey, okay, as a prophet, by this time next year, you have a child. He said, don't lie to me. I bless you because you are a prophet, not so that you can give me. He said, no, by my word, you have a child. The next year, she has a child. Listen to me, I'm going somewhere. She gets this child. The child grows. One day, the child is in the field with the father. The child falls sick. And the father says, let the child take him to the mother. Is she and the prophet that know where they have seen the boy. <laughs> take him to the mother. So they bring the child to the mother. And the mother carries the child to the bed that she had made for the prophet. And then she goes to the prophet. And as she shows up, the prophet says, hello, are you fine? It is well. Is it well with your family? It is well. Is it well with your boy? It is well. And then she comes close to the prophet. And says, sir, the boy. He said, no problem. And the prophet sends Geazi to go with a rod of authority. But not everyone that is with you is with you. The Bible said, they left us that it might be evident that they were never with us. Because everybody see, I used to make a mistake. Oh, ah, my son, my daughter, I made that mistake until they shook me, 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 shook me. And I suddenly realized that everybody is not your son. Some people come into your ministry as a student. They come to learn. And once they have graduated, they have gone. How many of you have called your lecturer since you graduated? When you were there, you loved him. After you graduated, he's a lecturer. Some people are served and they came to serve. After they have served, they have gone. How many of you have gone back to your youth couple days? No. Some people are saboteurs. They came to sabotage your work. Only few people are sons. Gehazi was with Elisha, but Gehazi was not a son. He was a servant of Elisha. He came there to serve. He was in line for the tetra portion of Elijah's anointing, but he couldn't get it. So when Elisha gave him the rod, thinking that he can do what he has been trained to do, by the time Gehazi got there, because his heart was not connected to the source of the grace, when he put the rod on the boy, the boy had the second death. The man of God had to come by himself and lay down on the boy to bring him back from second death to first death and then call him forth alive. But what you did not understand is that that woman made a vow and said, Lord, if you can bring this boy back to life, he will serve you all his life. So that boy had a vow on his head. Fast forward. Jonah. Because many of you did not know that that boy is Jonah. Yes, go and study your Bible. Go and do your... That boy was Jonah. So the mother placed a vow upon his head that no matter what you have died before, you will only serve God. Then God now came and said, it's time to collect my vow. Jonah, your mother placed you on the altar as a vow. Jonah go to Nineveh and go and save them. Jonah said, I'm not going. I'm going to Tashish. Every time you go on your own, you will pay your bills. 
And Jonah went to Tashish, and the flood was coming. Everything was shaking. And the people tried to save you. You can't save Jonah, man. You can't save Jonah. You hand them over to God. So that God can do them the way he wants. You cannot save Jonah. You cannot intercede for Jonah. The only thing to do with Jonah is hand him over to God. They lost their property. They lost many things. After a while, all the while when they were in trouble, where was Jonah? Sleeping. I want to share you soon. <laughs> People that are doing you that are sleeping, you are troubling yourself. Mountain to mountain. The guy was sleeping. They now went to him. He said, hey, wake up, wake up. And they asked him a question. Imboloti wani bolo loki ni share o kilo ruko ilure orile de wani wanje wifu wau. Is that your Bible? He said, Where are you coming from? Where are you going to? Which tribe are you from? What is your family? What do you do for a living? The guy said, ah, me, I'm running from God. <laughs> Say, you mean we have been risking our life for you? So what do we do now? He said, throw me into the ocean. I know my problem. Throw me into the ocean. They said, no, we cannot do that. How can it be said that we are the one that kill you? The Bible said, the road other stop suffering for people's problem. You are not a bad person. Some people, if you help them, God will hate you. God is the one dealing with them. They are in the school of Adnok. Hello? Can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar that God turned to animal? You now want to turn into a human being before the appointed time. You will join him in the school of animology. But guess what? Are you ready for this? Read your Bible very well. The Bible says... When they threw him into the water, the Lord has prepared a whale, private jet, at the bottom, waiting for repentance. The very minute they dropped him, private jet. Guess what? And God had instructed the whale to take him to Nineveh. For God already knew that when I show him mercy, he will repent before we get there. So read chapter 2 towards the end. The Bible says, and while Jonah was in the belly of the fish, he cried out to God and look at the prayer. Oh Lord, I remember my vow and I thank you with the voice of thanksgiving. And the Bible says, and the fish vomited him. Private jets. Because see, God is so merciful that he can lead you wrong. He will never lead you wrong. Well, he said, I will not let you go until I have accomplished what I propose to do in your life. He ended up in Nineveh. But you know, at the end of the day, you know what he said? After preaching, everybody repented, including the animal. And God had mercy on them. He said, that's why I didn't want to go. I already knew that it would be a useless venture. I know that after all the preaching, you will make me a false prophet. Because you will see forgive them. Now you are forgiving them again. He didn't understand the power of God's mercy. That that was the mercy that saved him. And it's a message that will save order. Somebody say, Vow. Ah, show me my time so that I can. Next is parental honor. Parental honor. Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 1 to 3. These are covenant obligations that triggers wealth. Parental honor. From Ephesians 6, it talks about honor. Children honor your parents, parents honor your children, and all those stuff. Listen. The same word honor in Proverbs 3, 5, uh, 3, 9. Honor the Lord. is the same word honor. Honor your parents. Honor is equal. Listen. Are you ready for this? He did not say honor your parents when they are good. He didn't say honor your parents when they are fantastic parents. He said honor your parents. Honor is not a levy. It's a covenant obligation. So it's not a levy to say, Ah, Tinuke! That's why you got to see your mama the hunger. She they do. I know they die for village. You never send money this month. Oh. No. The Bible says it is parents that lay off for the children, not children that lay off for the parents. So you are not giving to your parents to sustain them. You are not giving to them because they are hungry. It's a covenant obligation. And the Bible calls it the first commandment with a promise. It says, honor your father and mother so that your days will be longer. One of the secrets of long life is parental honor. Every month, something should drop to your parents. Even if it's 500 naira recharge card, mommy, stay connected. Daddy, stay connected. That's all. It's not a levy. 
But to think that that man, he didn't pay my school fees. He's a very bad man. Ah, what you sow is what you reap. So honoring your parents. Many of you are in the city and your mother is in the village. Still using firewood. Ordinary gas you can't buy for your mama to make life easy for her. Your mother is in the village suffering and you are in the city doing wrongs. You are in the city eating and your mother cannot boast of two meals a day. Error. You say, well, you don't know what my mother went You don't know what I went through. If she didn't give a womb, you would not be here. Why do you honor them? Because God used them as a vehicle to bring you into this world. Anything they do after that is not the reason for the honor. The reason for the honor is this is the womb through whom you came. This is the seed through whom you came. Because of time, let me run through so that if I can give you like 10. Next one is prophet's offering. Prophet's offering. Honoring your prophet. Matthew chapter 10 verse 41. He who honors a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Now listen to me. One of the major errors I have seen in the church today is what I call pastoral abuse. There is so much pastoral abuse going on in the church that people are using pastors and you begin to wonder. I have seen people, man of God, that we come into a church jobless, wifeless, visionless, carless, everything less. And by the grace of God upon the man of God and upon the house, within a five to seven year period, their story has changed. And they will not even think that this vessel that God has used to bless me, let me bless him back. Do you know, man of God, my members gather together. They have never bought me one suit. Never bought me one shirt. And then they gather. Oh, my own suit to the pastor. Man, what are you fit? You want what you told you that the suit I'm wearing is not good. That somebody should tell pastor to be wearing correct fitted suit. And they now appointed one woman as their voice. She now came, pastor, my pastor, pastor, me, my pastor. Ah, no, this year. So I looked, I said, so you people had the meeting. So I called all of them together. I said, have any of you ever bought me one shirt before? They started looking at themselves. I said, the one I bought with my money is not good enough. Because they don't understand. If you see that the man is not dressing well, did you give him a suit and he rejected it? No. That was the day they started buying suits. Because some people don't know. They don't know. It's not that they are bad, but they don't know. My first car, somebody gave it to me. Because see, one thing I learned, the Bible says, you will reap what you sow. It didn't say you will reap where you sow. So sometimes the greatest blessings of your life will come from outsiders. Not from inside, because of familiarity. Because as far as they are concerned, she be the one chopping all the offering. Because they think you are chopping all the offering. That's their mind. So God blessed me with the car from outside. And I brought the car to church to give testimony. I remember one, look at you. <laughs> no shame. And one of them looked at me, ah, pastor, we thank God for your life. Well, hey, now we can be proud to call you our pastor. True life story. We can, so that means all the, all the night vision, all the fasting, all the pray, they are not proud. And they didn't think of buying me a car. Hello? Listen to me. When God by a prophet was here, by a prophet the Lord brought them out of Egypt, by a prophet they were preserved. When David was going to war, one day he was almost killed. They said, no, 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 no. From today you are not going to war anymore. Lest the light of Israel be quenched. One man, a light of a nation. Strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Listen to me. If this man and this woman do not have the peace of mind to do this work, it is to your loss. Because if they have to be running elter skelter, hey, Scoofy, so I want to send my daughter to Canada. Hey, dollar has gone to 620. How will I do it? How will they have time to pray? They will be running around hustling, looking for how to gather money together to take care of their need. But when the needs are met, they will have enough time because they are not thinking money. Because anything that is money matter, God has raised sons and daughters that are taking care of it. Somebody should say, sir, don't worry, your DSTV forever. It's just, they should just be getting home. The DSC will never go off. They don't, don't, don't. Somebody should just say, Father, forget it. This will be here. 
don't think of it. You just be dropping it. Get my alpha. What you want? I'm going one thousand more. Somebody else should be in charge of the phone. Just be loading it. 100,000. They should have 300,000 naira on the phone. Because when counseling will start, nobody is thinking of phone. You call pastor. 36 minutes. And after you finish, thank you, sir. Who will recharge the 36 minutes that he has just used to pray for you? Who will recharge it? Angel? I don't understand. Angel? Is he not a human being like you? You are traveling. None of you have thought, okay, ah, keep pastor on lost summer. And they will now tell you, Pastor, the grace in on him is your grace. Your grace has given them car, has given them house, has made them travel abroad. You are still in no good. <laughs> they are not thinking that Pastor should travel. Abba, who did this to you? You will travel ordinary handkerchief, ordinary perfume, you won't bring. But when there is trouble, even from the exile of Canada, it's the same pastor you left behind that you'll be calling. If I let me, let me stop because I need to say two other things. So let's leave the, the go and get the book so that you get the remaining. So from today, make adjustments. Now, if I let me answer one question. He that bless a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. What is a prophet's reward? Hello? What's a prophet's reward? Number one. A prophet's reward is the grace that the prophet carries. You know more, the man of God was talking about all grace. Grace to grace. Throne of grace. Grace. Different people have different grace. So. Hello? And if you look at this service now, you see that everybody's coming with their own grace. You can't jump. You can't break ranks. Stay within your grace. This is my grace. Hello? Some of you now, you will start seeing money. Money will, money will just be flowing. It's a grace. Because when you are sick, you don't go to a lawyer. You go to a doctor. That's this grace. When your car has a problem, a doctor cannot help you. You need mechanic. So everybody carry grace. So the prophet over your life has a grace. When you sow into his life, one of the prophets blessing, the gift of a prophet, the reward of the prophet is that the grace upon his life begins to work for you. Philippians chapter 1 verse 7 You all are partakers of my grace. Why? Because grace can be shared. Number two a prophet's reward is whatever the prophet chooses to reward you with based on how pleasing he is with your seed. Read your Bible. There are many people that the prophet said by this time next year and they say, sorry, don't say anything. It's because of the prophet's reward. That woman was an example. He said, don't promise me anything. He said, no, by my word. Because you have blessed me with a house, I am telling you, because I said so, you will have a child. And by the time next year, she had a child. So what's the prophet's reward? Whatever the prophet decides to bless you with is a prophet's reward. Number three, what's the prophet's reward? The desire with which you sowed it is a prophet's reward. So if you are sowing into the life, I say, Lord, I want to bless as I'm blessing him. Lord, do this, do this, do this. That which is in your heart that you wanted heaven to do, that made you to obey that covenant, it's released. That's a prophecy word. So, I run through this as I close within the next seven minutes. So, number one, God is your source. Number two, the kingdom is the purpose for wealth. Number three, kingdom wealth is entrusted, not acquired. Number four, addiction to God and his kingdom is a trigger for kingdom wealth. Number five, uncompromising obedience to covenant obligation releases the blessing. Number six, let me give you six and seven. Number six, when you go after what God has not given you, he will take what he has given you. When you go after what God has not given you, he will take what he has given you. You know why? In this kingdom, it is about trust and faithfulness. So if God gives you little and you are not faithful with that little, and the one he told you not to touch, you are touching it. Even the one he has told you to touch, you will say, let me withdraw. Genesis, God gives them a garden and said, every tree here, you are free to touch. He said, but this particular one, don't touch. The one that he told them not to touch is the exact one that they went for. Why? Because every time God asks for something, that is what the enemy will fight. 
And when they touched it, what did God do? He took the garden from them. I can show you the trace all through scripture. Heab was a king. Every land belonged to him. But there was a land that belonged to a man by the name of Naboth. And the man said, it is that one that I want. When he touched the land of Naboth, what happened? The throne that God gave him. God withdrew the throne. David and Beersheba. David had many wives. There are many women in the city. When kings went to war, he decided he's a big boy now. You know, we're big now. As a big boy, no more prayer, no more fasting, no more evangelism. Let the boys be doing that. So guess what? He stood and saw a woman having a bath. The first look is not a crime. It's the second look that is a problem. When you saw, you say, ah, Shege Brondo, Shaka. You are supposed to just go back home. And if the tree enter your body, call one of your wives, say, Mama Karu, let's go to Jerusalem. And then you go and worship in the temple. Everything will be holy. But when he saw that one, first one, he now look at the second. That second look is the problem. When he looked the second, I said, Ah, Oluwao. How will you feel if I enter this website? This will be powerful. And he went downstairs. At that point, he's no more devil. Let no man say when he's tempted. I'm tempted. of the No. He said, every man is tempted when he's drawn of his own evil. Why are you not tempted to sleep with an animal? Why? Do animals wear clothes? Are they not naked on the streets? Why didn't you hold a dog? Or a cow? Or a ram? Is a healthy sister? It's because she was not dressing. No. Your sexual organ is your mind. Hello? It's not your manhood. It's your mind. If an 87-year-old woman is naked now, you won't have erection. Why? Because your mind will tell you there's nothing there. So it's a mind thing. It's not about organ. So when you saw, he said, okay, go and call her to come. And you all know the story. The very minute she took another man's wife, God said, your throne is taken away from you. So every time you touch what God tells you not to touch, it takes what he has given you. Something, God. I can go on and on and on. But let me close with this. The final point. Financial stewardship and management perpetuates kingdom wealth. Financial stewardship and management perpetuates kingdom wealth. God is a God of principles. And his intention is not for you to seek miracle every day. His intention is for you to perpetuate principles. So when you begin to activate all this covenant obligation, what happens is that wealth begins to flow. But that wealth, as a steward of the wealth, you now have to know how to manage it. When Joseph appeared before Pharaoh. What did he tell Pharaoh? He said, 20% of everything that you get in the days of plenty. What did he say? Save it. And by the law of savings and compound interest, in the years of famine, what you saved in plenty will save you in famine. So if you don't save, you are not safe. So one of the major things we need to understand is that as the money begins to come, in obedience to our covenant obligation, the final point is what? You must be a good steward of those resources and manage it well. Because if you make money and make money, but you don't manage it well, you will not be able to multiply the money. The money you cannot manage will not multiply in your hand. That woman was a widow, but three and a half years into famine, she was not in poverty. Why? She has saved enough that even when brooks were drying up, our investment was taking care of her. By the time the prophet showed up, three and a half years into famine, the woman was okay. It was when the natural was about to expire that God sent the prophet to shift her into the supernatural. Because the super will remain super without the natural. The natural will remain natural without the super. It's a combination of the super and the natural that produces the supernatural. So it's not just enough to say, oh, I gave and God blessed me. I gave and God blessed When he now blesses you, what did you do with the blessing? That is where savings come in. So you need to manage it well. Save it, invest it, and let it multiply. Two scriptures as I close. Luke chapter 19, verse 13 and verse 23. Luke 19, 13 and 23. And he called ten of his servants 
delivered to them 10 minutes and said to them, do business till I come. So as God begins to bless you with the money, what do you do? Put it into business. Put it into an investment that will continue to multiply. Pastors, may God deliver you from the foolishness of full-time ministry. Now listen, I'm a full-time pastor. But your definition of full-time ministry must be correct. Or else, your life will not be correct. Full-time ministry means that ministry must be your primary assignment. Not your only assignment. Hello? And guess what? You don't even go into full-time ministry until your hands are full. Not this 12 member, 13 member, 24 member alone is your full-time. If you are doing full-time, you should have 200 by now. So full-time, you're 14 local, you're after 10 years, and you say you're full-time minister. Something is wrong. Even if God call you full-time, he call your wife. And then you're doing first lady, I'm making it, daddy and mommy, I'm making it, I'm making it. No, 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 no. Full-time ministry means that ministry should be what? Your primary assignment. Not your only assignment. So as money comes from love offering, prophetic offering, carry that money and do business till I return. Do books. Come up with your own books. Come up with your own tips. Come up with seminars. Buy land. Buy houses. Start a school. Start something. Let the money work for you. Because if you don't put the money to work, it will go. Now, that's verse what? Okay, verse 23. Why then did you not put my money where? In the bank. That at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. That's Jesus talking. You know? So I'm showing you that kingdom wealth, after you have gone through the journey, stewardship and financial management. So how do you manage it? Use the banking system. Use the financial system. All the opportunities of the world. Use it. How do you manage it? Put it into business and investment that will make it to multiply. And Ecclesiastes 11, 1 and 2 says, Ecclesiastes 11, 1 and 2. Final scripture. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 and 2. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Verse 2. Give a servant to seven and also to hate, for you do not know what evil will be on the head. Give me another translation, message, new living translation of verse 2. Another translation. Verse 2. Don't order your goods. Spread them around. Spread them where? Around. Be a blessing to others. This could be your last chance. Your last and next. But divide your what? Your investment among many places. For you do not know what risk my lie ahead. So as the money begins to come, activate multiple streams of income. And as you put it in different income stream, do you know what happens? The money will continue to flow. Rise up and I prophesy this over your life. This is the scripture God gave me for this church. This is the prophetic word over this house. Ezekiel 34, verse 25 and 26. And I will make them, global impacts, a covenant of peace. And I will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land. All the members of global impacts shall dwell safely. They will dwell safely in the wilderness, sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places round about them a blessing. I will cause the showers to come down upon Global Impact Church in the season. And there shall be showers of blessing. I hope with this few points of mine, I've been able to convince you and not confuse you. Kingdom wealth is your portion. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Amen.